from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. That same day, the day of the resurrection, two of Jesus' disciples were on their way to a village called Emmaus. And as they were walking, they were talking about all the things that had been happening. Now it happened that Jesus came and journeyed with them. But something prevented them from recognizing who he was. What things are you talking about, brothers, as you walk along? They stopped short, their faces downcast. Then one of them called Cleophas answered, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening there these past few days. What things, brothers? All about Jesus of Nazareth who proved he was a great prophet in the sight of God and all the people, and how our chief priests and elders handed him over to have him crucified. Our own hope had been that he would be the one to set Israel free. And that is not all. Two whole days have gone by since it all happened, and some women from our group went to the tomb, and not finding the body, they came back to declare they had seen a vision of angels who declared he was alive. Now, some men from our group went to the tomb, and they found everything exactly as the women had said. But of him they saw nothing, not a thing. You foolish men, so slow to believe the full message of the prophets. Was it not ordained that the Christ would suffer and die, and so enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and going through all of the scriptures, he explained those passages that were about himself. When they reached the place to which they were going, he made as if to go on, but they pressed him to stay with him. The day is almost over, and night is almost here. So he went in, and he took his place at table, and he took the bread, and he pronounced the blessing and he broke the bread and he gave it to each of them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. But he had vanished from their sight. Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and explained the scripture to us. They set out that instant for Jerusalem, and there they found the eleven assembled together who declared, Yes, it is true, he has risen, and he's appeared to Simon. Then they told their story of what had happened on the road and how they had come to recognize him in the breaking, in the breaking, of the bread. Without a doubt, that's my favorite resurrection story. Chapter 24 from Luke's Gospel. 
I believe it's the story actually of every Christian. Because just like those disciples on the road to Emmaus, don't we go through periods of doubt within our own life? We have expectations of how our life is going to play out. We have dreams and we have hopes, and sometimes things play out exactly the way that we want them. But most of the time, life is filled with twists and turns, just like those disciples. They had seen Jesus perform miracles. They had followed him for some time, and their faith was strong in him, but they had expectations of what a Messiah was going to look like. Certainly, they could never have imagined a crucified Messiah. When they saw Lazarus come forth from the grave, perhaps they even saw Jesus walk on the water. Perhaps they were there when he multiplied the loaves and the fishes. Maybe they were even there at the wedding feast of Cana. We don't know all of the details, but what we do know is that they had a strong belief in him. But that belief was shattered and ended when Jesus was crucified. They were leaving Jerusalem and they were going to this town of Emmaus. Now, I love this detail of the story, that Jesus walks along with them. As you may have surmised, I have a background in drama and storytelling, and I, and I love the fact that Jesus walks along with them and he doesn't let on who he is. They say to him, where have you been? Are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's going on? And Jesus plays along with, well, guys, I've been out of town a little while. No, tell me, why are you so upset? And they open their hearts and they share their sad story, their story of disappointed dreams and, and hopes. I think that's an important element because the Lord invites each one of us to share our life story with him in prayer. Sometimes we think that when we come into prayer, we have to be on our best behavior and we have to tell the Lord, the Lord all the good deeds that we've, we've done. The Lord doesn't the Lord already knows what's going on. And if our hearts have been broken or we're angry or we're frustrated or we're disappointed, what the Lord wants more than anything else is for us to be honest in our prayer. That's the key to how we grow, is to be honest about the struggles in our own life. And the disciples on the road to Emmaus are that. They're honest and they name their hopes. And after Jesus has teased out their story and they've told what needed to be told, Jesus connects their story with the great story of Scripture. He marries the two together. He says to them, was it not necessary that the Christ would suffer and die and so enter into his glory? The path to the resurrection has to go through Good Friday, or as the Great preacher Archbishop Fulton Sheen used to say, there's no Easter Sunday without a Good Friday. And then when they reached the place to which they were going, Jesus again, as the actor, pretends to go on. Another important detail, they had to invite him to come and to be with them. They had to invite him into their banquet and into their evening meal. So it is with each one of us, I think, over and over again, we need to invite Jesus into our families. We need to invite Jesus into our ministry. We need to invite Jesus into our marriages. We need to invite Jesus into the joys and the struggles of our hearts. We have to ask him to be there with us because the Lord will never break down the door. He comes to those hearts that welcome him, that invite him in, and those disciples do that. And they break this bread. He, he, he says the blessing, and he breaks the bread. And at that moment, and the Eucharistic overtones are very clear in Luke's Gospel, at that moment their eyes are opened and they recognize Jesus. It's as if Luke is saying to that early Christian community, where do we find Jesus? We find him at Mass. We find him in the Holy Eucharist. We find him in this breaking of his body under the form of bread. 
and their eyes are opened. And then I love this detail. They say, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and explained the scripture to us? They think back on the experience and then the light bulb goes off and they realize that their hearts were burning. Isn't that so often that we have the experience, but we're so caught up in the experience, it's only when we take time to reflect on it that we begin to say, that was a really significant moment in my life. That's one of the reasons why St. Ignatius Loyola, uh, the founder of the religious order I belong to, the Jesuits, St. Ignatius insisted that at the end of the day, we take 10 to 15 minutes and we think back over our day and we just ask ourselves, where have I found God in this day? What have been the choices that led me closer to the Lord? What have been the choices that led me further away from the Lord? like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. When their eyes are opened, they think back on the experience and they say, when we were on the road, our hearts were burning as he connected the scripture to us. And then they can't wait to get back to the, to the community of faith and to share their story of what had happened. And their faith encourages the faith of the disciples who, who were gathered together. And they say, yes, it is true. He's appeared to Simon. And they say, and we saw him too. Isn't that the way it works? So many people say, I'm spiritual. I'm not religious. I don't know if I need to go to church. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. They're a bunch of phonies. I'm just going to find God on my own. Yes, we can find God on our own. No question about that. But just like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, when we share our story of how God has come into our life, it bolsters the faith of others and others' faith strengthens our faith. Notice that Jesus appeared to those disciples as a team. There were two of them together. And one of those disciples is named Cleophas. The other is, un is unnamed. Who's that other disciple? That other disciple is you. That other disciple is me. Because that's why I say this story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus is everyone's story. You know, this came alive to me in a very personal and profound way with the death of two very significant people in my life, my dad and my best friend. My dad died of cancer. It took 12 years and he went in and out of remission and he had all kinds of therapy and there was a gradual diminishment. My dad was not a crier, but I'll never forget the day he came home from the doctors and he told us, I have cancer and they think it's terminal. And he broke down and cried. I had never seen my dad cry before. And he said, Michael, don't misunderstand, I'm not afraid of death, I'm not afraid of meeting God, but I am afraid of losing everything that I've worked for my entire life. You see, my dad was a self-made man. His dad had died when he was only 12 years old, so he had to work to put his sister through school. He had to work to put himself through school. He was a brilliant businessman. He, he owned his own business company and he did very well. And my dad's motto was, if I'm gonna join an organization, I may as well be president because nobody's gonna run it better than me. That was my dad's motto. He was a leader. And when he got cancer, he could see the handwriting on the wall that everything that he had worked for was gonna be stripped away. And his worst fears were realized. First. He lost the ability to be able to walk. He had to walk with a, with a walker. Then he lost control of his bladder. He lost control of his bowels. In the end, he couldn't even feed himself. In the end, and my dad, if he could do anything, he could talk. He was a great salesman. In the end, he lost the ability to be able to speak. And that overwhelmed my dad. He shut down, he closed, he closed up. And he pushed away the people in his, that he loved the most. My mom, his wife, all the members of our family. We couldn't get inside because that experience of losing everything, like those disciples on the road to Emmaus, having their hearts dashed. My dad's hopes were, were dashed and he pushed us out. And I kept praying, Lord, 
crack open my dad's heart so that he can experience that peace before he dies. And to be sure, there were little moments here and there. By and large, my dad was overwhelmed by the suffering and the humiliation that the cancer brought. He was a proud man. He was a leader. And when, he was, when it was taken away, it cracked his spirit that he never recovered from. I prayed for my dad long and hard after, after he died. And I believe that he is at peace, but it was not a happy death. Not too long after my dad died, my best friend, a diocesan priest from Cincinnati, Father Jim Willig, was diagnosed with cancer. What was ironic about that was we had just returned from leading a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. We had just been at Emmaus. The story that I just told you a few moments ago, I acted that out on, on the actual site that scholars believe the town of Emmaus is, is located. And when we got back, back from that pilgrimage, my best friend, Father Jim, said, doctors have told me I have two years to live. I have renal cell cancer that has metastasized and spread to my body. Father Jim was in Cincinnati and the, archdiocese, the, the archbishop there asked everybody in the archdiocese to pray for Father Jim. He was very popular, charismatic. He had his own TV show. He had his own uh, Bible study. He had 500 Catholics come into his parish every day to study each week the, the gospel. But despite the, the most advanced uh, it, uh, medicine that was available at the, at the time, they couldn't stop the cancer. But here was the difference between my friend Father Jim and my dad. In the midst of the profound stripping and the pain and the humiliation of the cancer, Father Jim was able to open his heart. He invited me to become his spiritual director. I was living in Chicago, he was in Cincinnati, but we committed to weekly phone meetings. And as often as I could, at least every other month and sometimes every month, I made that journey back and forth between Cincinnati and Chicago. And Father Jim poured out his heart. He poured out his anger. He poured out his frustration. He poured out his fear. He didn't hide anything back from those conversations with me. And more importantly, I encouraged him to continue to bring all of that into his prayer. And Father Jim, in the midst of that two-year cancer journey, went from being a holy priest to a saint, to an extraordinarily holy individual. And that became transparent. In the two years of his cancer journey, the size of his parish tripled. In the two years of his and in the two years of his cancer journey, he touched more people more profoundly than the 25 years of his priesthood prior to that, because he became so radically real. When people talked about, when he talked about his suffering and people heard him preach, and he talked about the intimacy that he was experiencing in the Lord in prayer, people knew that he wasn't BSing them. He was telling them the truth. He was opening his heart, and it was a wisdom, and it was an intimacy that was born of great pain. When Father Jim died, on the newspapers, on the major headlines in the Cincinnati newspaper, and on at least two, if not three, of the major television networks, they carried the news, Holy Priest dies of cancer inspires thousands. Now I just ask you, when was the last time you saw a picture of a priest on a secular paper or on a secular news show ins inspiring people with the heroism with which he embraced his suffering? Father Jim invited me into his heart. My, that was a great healing in my life because I love my dad very much, but the suffering that my dad endured broke him. And he pushed us away because he was frightened 
to allow us to see him that vulnerable. The gift that Father Jim gave me and to so many was in the midst of his suffering, he allowed us to see him. And that was a profound healing in my life. It healed that brokenness that I experienced from my own, from my dad's own death. Did people change in life? Some do, some don't. The gift of faith allows us in the twists and turns of life, in the heartaches and the disappointments, not to simply be shattered, but to be transformed. The one saint that I knew in my life is Father Jim Willick, and he was privileged to be my friend. His story gives me hope. When I feel discouraged, when I, when I experience disappointments or heartaches or failures or my own sin threatens to overwhelm me, it's at those times that I remember Father Jim and his example. It's at those times that I remember I'm still on that journey. I'm that unnamed disciple walking with the Lord, and he invites me to tell my story to him as he invites you to tell your story, to come to church, to let your eyes be opened and to recognize him in the breaking of the bread. Amen. Amen. <laughs>